Um, so for announcements, I'm just going to go through a few of the things. Um, I, I wrote that there's none this week on our announcements, but there really is. Um, tonight is that Brian Free and Assurance um, concert uh, at Moravia Lighthouse, um, and that starts at 6 o'clock. Uh, I think there's a few people going to that. I believe the tr the Teresas are going to that. We'll say that <laughs> the Teresas <laughs> are going to that. So if anybody wants to go, I don't know what time they're leaving. We're not going to be attending that. Um, but if you want to, to try to meet up there, that would be great. You can talk to them. Um, this Tuesday, there's a prayer service for Ukraine at 7 o'clock at the courthouse lawn. Um, so we will be gathering together with um, several churches. It's, it's um, the Inner Church Council that's kind of putting that together. So several churches, um, including the Ukrainian churches, um, will be there. So that'll be a good time to gather together and to, um, to come together in prayer for Ukraine. Um, bring your lawn chairs if you are unable to stand. It, they said that the, they assume it's going to be about an hour, but as I said before, we've kind of left it open to the Ukrainian pastors to, to pray as long as they want. So it might be over an hour. So um, let's gather together for that. Uh, we will not have the book dying to going through the book dying to restart this week just because as you notice we're missing a lot of our congregation and a lot of the people that are going through that book so we will start that back up next Sunday we'll still have a few people missing but not as many um, June 25th is a men's prayer breakfast and June 27th is the women's gathering and then to get it on your calendar, July 3rd, we're having the ecumenical service, the 4th of July service. So the 4th of July service on the 3rd <laughs> um, at 9 o'clock at the square, so 9 a.m. I should have put a.m. in there. And then July 15th is district assembly. If anybody's interested in going to that, just let me know. Um, I'll need to have everybody registered um, for that. So I think those are all our announcements. Um, we have some prayer requests, kind of the same, the same ones. I really want us to pray uh, specifically on this um, Pentecost Sunday for the vision of the church and what God wants us to do, um, just that he makes that very clear to all of us. We're going through this book, um, Dying to Restart, and it's, I, I think it's opening a lot of our eyes to what the church needs to be. And so I just pray that God just continues to lay on our hearts um, that vision for the church. Um, and then just uh, continues to be in prayer. Uh, my dad had his appointment, um, and he they have decided on a... Um, on a course of action for what's going on there. Um, so I'll share details on that, um, but I, d I haven't talked to him um, about that specifically, so I'm sure just continue to keep him in prayer um, and my mom and the doctors that will be helping him. So let's go ahead and pray um, for these prayer requests. Lord, we just... We just are so thankful, Lord, that we get to come together, that we get to come together and to worship you, to sing our praises to you, and to pray to you, Lord, and that you hear our hearts, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you continue to guide us as a church, continue to guide our hearts in what it is that you want us to do, Lord. Just continue to speak to us and make that message clear, Lord, and Lord, I just thank you that, that you have been speaking to us and that we know you have. Lord, I just pray that you just continue. Lord, I pray for the situation with my, my father, Richard, Lord, that you just continue to be with him, continue to guide him, continue the doctors that are helping him on this journey. Lord, I pray that you just continue to be with him continue to be with my mom. 
Lord, I pray that you bring healing to this. Lord, I pray that you just touch him. We know, Lord, that you bring healing in a multitude of ways, that sometimes you reach down in an instant and there's healing. And I, I know, Lord, that sometimes you use doctors and medicines for that healing. And Lord, I pray that whatever way you use, that you just bring healing. Lord, I just pray that you continue to be with those that are gone from us today. Continue to guide them and keep them safe. Bring them back safely, Lord. There's a lot of travel in the next couple weeks. And Lord, I pray that you just continue to be with each and every person in our church and, and just continue to build this hedge of protection around them, Lord, and get them to and from safely. Lord, I pray that you just continue to be with us this day. Continue to guide our hearts and our minds. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We are going to sing now, <clears throat> Great and Mighty. Great, great and mighty is the Lord our God. Great and mighty is He. Great and mighty is the Lord our God. Great and your banner let the anthems ring praises to our king great and mighty is the lord our god great and mighty is he great and mighty is the lord our god great and mighty is he great and mighty is the lord our god great and Next, we're going to sing When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. As I was writing the message um, this week, I, the last verse just continued to go through my head, and it's that, that love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. And I just wanted us to, I wanted to see, keep that in the, the front of our mind as we go today, through the message today, and so I wanted us to sing this song. We're going to sing um, verses in, in the music there, verses 1 and 3 and 5, so... i 
And then we're going to sing, Open Our Eyes. <coughs> just thank you for this day, this beautiful day once again. And Lord, we pray that you do open our hearts and our minds and our eyes to what it is that you want us to learn today, Lord. Lord, I know that this message has weighed heavy on my heart this week and that it is a message that you want, you want to be heard. And Lord, I just pray that you continue to work on my heart, continue to work on our hearts collectively as a church. And Lord, I just pray, I just pray that you just continue to guide us, continue to show us what it is that you want us to do, Lord. Lord, I just pray that we do have our eyes open to what Jesus wants of us, that we do continue to act and to represent Jesus well. And Lord, I pray that you just continue to guide us on that. Lord, I pray that the words that come out of my mouth when we get to this message are all of you and none of me. And Lord, I pray that you just continue to work on our hearts. Be with us that are here today and be with those that aren't here today for whatever reason. Lord, just continue to be with us. Lord, we just love you and we give you all the praise. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Before I start my message today, I'm going to invite Lauren up, and he is going to do a short message with the children. I don't know if you need this um, stand or not. <coughs> well, you take all the time you need. I'm just kidding. Come on, kids. Come on up here. We've got a story. Sit down right here. Be bashful. Anybody else want to come? You can. And uh, oh, there's another kid. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? <laughs> okay. Um, I got a I got a verse of scripture I want to read. And no, no, that's this is fine. This is fine. Uh, but before I start, I want to tell you something. I love to pick up trash. It is so much fun to pick up trash. Now, really, I'm I'm serious. And if you go down the street and pick up trash, when you come back home, the street looks so nice. And it's fun. And the only thing, sometimes you get pick up a, a ketchup thing from Hardee's or something, and it gets all over your hands. But, but really, you know, one time I found a $20 bill. Wow. And, and so it, pick, picking up trash is fun. But that's not my story. I've got another story. And uh, Jesus... This is called the Sermon on the Mount. Why would they call a sermon a Sermon on the Mount? They've never called Marcy's sermon a Sermon on the Mount. 
Why? You know why? Because mount means mountain, and Jesus was on the side of a mountain. So they called it the Sermon on the Mountain. Sermon on the Mount. But this is what Jesus said here. This is one quick thing. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Jesus told us he was the light of the world, but then he says that we are the light of the world. Now, picking up trash has some benefits. I found this when I was picking up trash. Looky there. Push the button. Looky there. It's a flashlight. You're right. But when I found this, it was laying in the sand and the salt, and it was filthy. And I pushed a button. Nothing happened. And I thought, I'm not going to throw it away. And my wife knows I don't like to throw stuff away. Look at her, roll her eyes. But anyway, so I took this home. I washed it. I cleaned it up. I took the batteries out of it and cleaned it up inside. I put new batteries in it, and I pushed a button. Ah, the light. And that's a, each one of us, before we come to Jesus, we're dirty, we're filthy, we're full of sin. But that's why Jesus came and gave his life, so that he can wash us and make us clean. And so we can be the light of the world. And we can show everybody it's not our light, it's Jesus shining through us. And you know the interesting thing about light? That is the first thing that God created. That's yeah, that's right. That's a light. But that's the, those are the first recorded words of God. Let there be light. And what happened? There was light. That's right. And so that's what God wants to do to each one of us. He wants to take away our sin and clean us up so that we can be his light in this world. And you know what? If God hadn't have created light when he created the sun and the moon and the stars, they couldn't have shined because God had to make light. He made light the very first thing, and I think it was about the fourth day before he made the sun. But see, he'd already created light, so when he made the sun, ha, ah, it was bright. So let's ask Jesus to take away our sin, come into our life so that we can be a light because kids, we're living in a dark day, and there's a lot of mean people, and, but we can be a light and show the love of Jesus to each one of us, that we, each one that we know and come in contact with. Let's, let's have a prayer. Jesus, uh, I love these kids. And Lord, I pray that you might bless each one of them, Lord. And help them, Jesus, that there will be a point in their life, at, 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 in their youth, Lord, that they will give their heart and life to Jesus so that they can shine and they can be the light of the world. I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lauren, for that. Um, for that message that we are the light and, and that fits you know it always fits perfectly <laughs> um not even planned and god's got a plan we don't have a plan um i'll warn you guys today that as i was talking to adam about this morning um that the message today was kind of one of those messages that God had just kind of flooded into my heart. And um, I wrote it all down in a couple days and uh, I read through it and kind of went, Lord, you can't be serious. You don't want me to say that. <laughs> um, and he was like, yeah. And so... I, I told Adam this morning, I said, if there's ever been a day w that I kind of wanted to call in sick to work, it would have been today. <laughs> um, but as you guys know, I don't back usually back down when God's trying to tell me something to do. So you've got me this morning as much as I might be. Like, you might see me physically <laughs> shaking <laughs> this morning um, because I am very, this message is um, one 
I told Adam that uh, if we get down the line and, and uh, if my professors for um, my classes for sermons r watch this one, they might go, um, that, that was not a sermon. <laughs> and I'll go, uh, well, that's what God wanted. <laughs> so I guess, um, I guess that's what it is. So um, it might be different than some of the other sermons that I've given and might be different than other sermons that you've heard, but that's all right. Um, that's what God is asking of this morning. So we are still in this sermon series. These are the people in your neighborhood. Uh, this is kind of coming, we're coming around to this idea of who these people are. We've already discussed, if you think about that nursery, or not nursery rhyme, but the old rhyme, here's the church, here's the steeple, open the door, see all the people. We've talked about the church, who the church is biblically, right? We've gone through those definitions of the way that the church is described. Um, we had Dorothy here for one of those sermons, and now we're getting into the people who are people. And one thing I want us to think about today is when we think about the people, specifically what the people think of the church as well, because we can have the biblical definition of the church and we can have what we think of the church, but we also have to think about what do the people outside the church think of the church. And that's something we have to, to think through this morning. Um, in these last few months, God has asked me to really look into who are the people in our neighborhood. And so I've searched the statistics of people living here in Sheraton. Um, and through this search, God has given me the pictures of two families that are the statistical equivalent of people living here in Sheraton. Um, this idea is not a... a an odd idea of the church um, or of me. This idea has been uh, one that several churches have gone through and done. Um, it just so that they have, when in, their, in the example, it was just one person. Um, but I don't want us to just think of one person in this community. I want us to think of a family group. Um, and so when I talk about this family today, I want you to know for sure, that this was not anything, like this is not anybody that I know specifically from this community, that this is legitimately just a handful of statistics stuck together to represent a family. Um, names are popular names in our community. Um, occupations are popular occupations in our community. So if this sounds from, and I did Google the names um, just to try to see if there's actually someone named that in this community because I don't want them to be like, you're talking about me. <laughs> um, and I tried to do that and I did not find anybody, but we'll see. You might come up to me afterwards and go, I, I know people by that name. <laughs> um, and then I'm, yeah, I'm not going to change the name just because we're going to follow these families through the rest of the sermon series. So, but I just wanted to say, absolutely, this is not um, me finding a family and asking them intimate questions. This is statistics, and some of the statistics I'll share with you guys as we go through this. Um, today, we are going to be talking about, or we're going to be speaking about <laughs> being seen and seeking, so seeking and being seen. And we're going to talk about not only this family, but we're going to talk about the story of Zacchaeus. Um, but first, before we get into the story of Zacchaeus, I want us to start by meeting this family. This is the Johnson family, if you guys can see this picture. I'll turn this light off so we can see it a little better. <coughs> this is the Johnson family, a statistical equivalent of a family here in Sheraton. Uh, John Johnson is 41 years old and Marguerite is 38. John is a truck driver for Hy-Vee. As I said, it's the statistics. <laughs> uh, Marguerite works at the Hy-Vee Distribution Center. They both have high school diplomas. 
They have one daughter in middle school. They do not attend church, and we will get to the why here in a little bit. Um, I kind of wish that this was an actual picture of a family here in Sheraton. I really do wish that this was a family here in Sheraton that was willing to open up about their experiences because I think putting flesh to this would help this idea for us. I'm a visual person, so that's why I wanted to have a picture um, it would have been even better if we could have gotten an actual family to come and to stand here and for us to talk with them about why they don't attend church. The rough thing about pictures and about um, not having this visual equivalent to someone, and, and we, we notice this most often now that we have this internet age, right, where this person sitting on the other side of this, this computer screen doesn't matter, um, because when we don't have a picture, when we haven't seen someone in person, it's still easy for us to think that they're not really a person. Um, it's still easy for us to degrade them or to not have compassion for them, but I would say, but God sees all people as people, as made in his image, and he has compassion for, him, for them. And it's us humans that lack on that compassion or seeing someone as made in God's image, and that's what we're going to talk to about today. I'm going to turn this light back on. Now, this concept isn't a foreign fact. Um, it's happening on all fronts, in the church and not in the church, that people don't see people as people, as made in God's image. Uh, another Nazarene, an, Another, another Nazarene pastor shared on Facebook this week in a, in a forum for Nazarene pastors. And he talked about this story, and then he said this phrase that echoed in my heart this week, it is hard to hate up close. Meaning, when you have someone in front of you and you are faced with the reality that they are human, it's hard to not see them as a human, as made in God's image. It's hard to not interact with them and to ask them about their story. It's hard to hate up close. Now, I want us to get into the story of Zacchaeus real quick. <coughs> And I want us to, um, we're going to go, once again, we're going to go kind of verse by verse on this and um, kind of break this down of what's going on here. And I want us to think about this, the story of Zacchaeus as Jesus coming into this, into Jericho and seeing Zacchaeus be seeking, but also Zacchaeus being seen. So let's read verse 1. So our, the story of Zacchaeus is in Luke uh, chapter 19. So let's read verse 1. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. So Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. So he's still in Jewish territory. That's one of the differences between this story and the story we had last week. He is in Jewish territory. Um, Jericho has some rich stories in the biblical text, if we have read some of the Old Testament. So, um, and just one of those stories, in, 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 this one's in the New Testament, but that story of the Good Samaritan, when Jesus talks about this road, it's the road between Jericho and Jerusalem. So just, um, so we kind of have that idea. Um, so let's continue on. 
On verse 2, a man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was the chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. (coughs) So here we have Zacchaeus. We have our character, right? Zacchaeus, not just a tax collector, but the chief tax collector, right? Um, He was one of the ones that oversaw the other tax collectors. He was despised being a tax collector because tax collectors were considered sinners, right? So being a chief tax collector kind of set him up in this biblical story as chief sinner, right? Even though tax collectors were very rich, they would have lived on the margins of society, meaning that they wouldn't be, they wouldn't have been seen as people. They would have been seen as people that aren't really people, people that aren't really human or made in the image of God. And Zacchaeus was short in stature, and he wanted to see Jesus. So Zacchaeus was seeking, right? He was seeking, but he was unable to see because Jesus, because of the crowd. His sight of who Jesus was was blocked by people. Now, I think we could maybe all agree that if we were Zacchaeus, if we were the chief sinner and Jesus was coming to town and we were short in stature, that maybe we would have just given up, right? Maybe we would have given up seeking this Jesus. But that's not what Zacchaeus did because he climbs a sycamore fig tree. And in this region, sycamore fig trees were prevalent Um, They were a light but durable wood, and they produced fruit. So they were very profitable for Jericho. So we've got this very sinful, wealthy man who is short, trying to seek Jesus, and he climbs up in this tree that is very profitable. Let's continue on. Verses five, or verse five through seven. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, he's gone to be the guest of a sinner. So Jesus, Zacchaeus climbs the tree seeking Jesus, and Jesus sees Zacchaeus. Out of all the crowd that day, Jesus was seeking and he found Zacchaeus, the chief tax collector. And what does Jesus say to him? I must, I must stay at your house today. So so Zacchaeus welcomed, we see this, we see this Um, I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. So we have movement in this passage. We have now went from where this tree is to Zacchaeus welcoming him to the house. And then we have this line in the piece. The people saw this and began to mutter, he has gone to be the guest of sinner. The crowd, the crowd so large that Zacchaeus had to climb a tree to see Jesus began to mutter, I can't believe that this Jesus is associating with this man. Why would Jesus care about this man, this man on the margins, this man who is not even a man? The crowd had cast its judgment on Zacchaeus. No matter whether they were right or wrong to cast their judgment on Zacchaeus, they had done so. But Zacchaeus, oh, let's continue on. But, but Zacchaeus, oh, I, my page flipped. 
But Zacchaeus stood up in verse 8 and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Zacchaeus, when he got down to it, and the Lord saw him, and saw that he was an actual person, and and said with his actions, you are a person created in the image of God. Zacchaeus had a change of heart. Zacchaeus, I'm sure, was praying that Jesus, this Jesus would see him, would see Zacchaeus as the person that he could be instead of seeing him for who he was right at that moment, right? And that is exactly how Jesus saw him. The crowds, the crowds that filled that area did not see Zacchaeus as who he could be. They only saw Zacchaeus as who he was at that moment, right? They didn't have the eyes of Jesus to see who Zacchaeus could be and the influence that Zacchaeus could have or who Zacchaeus was to God. They just cast their judgment and grumbled that Jesus had gone to his house. And then we have the closing of the story in verse 9. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. We'll come back to that last verse. I got ahead of myself. <clears throat> Jesus states this as a reminder that this man too is also a son of Abraham. This man too is a creation of God, made in the image of God. Even Zacchaeus, the chief sinner, is not so far gone for God to restore him. Even Zacchaeus is significant in this kingdom story. Even Zacchaeus. Even Zacchaeus, who was the chief tax collector or the chief sinner among Jericho, deserved to be seen by Jesus, the God incarnate. Even God cared deeply enough for Zacchaeus to see him and to hear him. And then Jesus states his mission. <coughs> for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. A little um, word study for us quickly. Salvation is transliterated into this word, um, the first word up there. And so the root of the word, the sozo, um, that's the root of this word. So the word itself means a deliverance, but the root word is to save, to rescue, to heal. We know through this, through this word study, that part of salvation is a healing, a bringing back to peace, a bringing back to this shalom that we hear about, or bringing back to wholeness. Jesus found the one on the edges, Zacchaeus, the one who decidedly was the most broken in this crowd, the chief sinner in this crowd, the one that the crowd had judged, and Jesus said, I see you, and I must stay at your house today. Let's see that family photo again, Adam. As I said, this statistical makeup of a family here in Sheraton doesn't attend church. There's a long and complicated story to that. You see, Marguerite's family attended church. 
But when Marguerite was 15, she had a run-in with a man. And let's just say, I'll try to keep this PG with the kids, but we'll just say that things ended up not the way that she wanted them to. And it was not her choice. That she had an abortion at that time and she saw it as the only option because she knew what her parents would say and the weight of that burden on them. And she didn't want it to admit that it wasn't her choice because she didn't want to go to the police and she didn't want to have all of that and, and she's seen how the other girls were treated. So she shouldered this burden alone. And when she was entering the clinic, she was told how disgusting she was and how God hated her for what she was doing her. And that God would never love her. And the pain of these words and the pain of the guilt weighs her down. And because of the crowds, she's convinced that God would never love her because of what she did. Later in life, she married John, and they had a hard time conceiving in the voices of the crowds that she had heard way back when, now told her that the reason why she was having trouble was because God was punishing her. So, before she felt the hurt of God's rejection, she decided to just reject him. John has his own skeletons in the closet. He felt rejected by God as well. He was told as a child that he was never good enough and that he would that he wasn't good enough and that he would never be good enough. And and church and heaven are only for those that turn their life around. And he learned as a child growing up in church that there are so many different unwritten rules that he realizes he would never make it, so he admitted defeat before he even tried. John, as I said, this statistical equivalent to a family here in Sheraton, is addicted to pornography and drinks heavily, and both of these things affect his marriage. They see the church as, and I'm bringing up statistics that are equivalent to, to people that don't attend church. They ask people that do not attend church how they see the church. And they see this church, or a church, any church, 87% see it as judgmental. I'm talking non-church-going people that filled out the survey. 85% see it hypocritical, 70% see it insensitive to others. As I said, the percentages beside these words are the percentages of non-church-going people that feel this way, and that's on a national level. That's not statistics specifically here to Sheraton. We're talking a national level. Can we see the picture of the family again, Adam? <coughs> Their daughter is in middle school in drinks. And you guys might go, wait a minute, a middle schooler drinking? 35% of eighth graders have admitted to drinking. There's the statistics for you. She's bullied at school and has grown up with her father's influence to mask the pain through alcohol. Now this girl will grow up and attempt to commit suicide. A study in 2019 showed that 18.8% .8 of high school students have seriously considered attempting suicide. Now imagine in the life of this family if the crowds had parted and Jesus had seen them. What a turnaround. I can already hear the argument, but Pastor Marcy Zacchaeus was seeking 
Jesus. That's the difference. This family isn't seeking Jesus. They've already turned their back to him. They have already turned their back to what could be. But I would argue that all of creation, whether they know it or not, all of creation has this longing this sense of seeking the creator. The, the question that we always try to answer is this, why are we here, right? It's a deep longing in ourselves. And some of us have realized why we are here. And others are still seeking that question. They are seeking whether they know that they're seeking or not. Some of us start this church in childhood because, and because of non-healthy conversations about God, they gave up. And, and maybe some people started in adulthood, and, and because of the way that Christians speak or act, they decided that God absolutely wasn't who they were searching for. They argue that if instead of seeing people as the chief sinner, or I argue that instead of seeing people as the chief sinner, we need to see them as made in the image of God and interact with them in the way that that way. Instead of being a crowd that's casting judgment on them for what they have done in their past, we need to act like Jesus and see them for the way that God sees them. And maybe, just maybe if more Christians did that, if more Christians, instead of casting their judgment on them and saying, Jesus, why would you even go to that house? Why would you even go to that house? If less Christians cast their judgment, then maybe more people would start on that search again as to why they are here. Sometimes <coughs> the crowd of people that believe themselves to be righteous are really unrighteous. And that's what Luke brings his attention to in his writing, even before this story of Zacchaeus. We have the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector, and we're going to read that. I know we're getting closer to time, but I want us to read this to see this. In Luke 18, so the chapter just before, we have this parable that Luke tells us that Jesus said, to some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. Do we think that's a coincidence? No. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, or robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a, a tenth of all I get. Lord, please see me, because I have done all the things that I need to do. I am good and I am righteous, right? But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And then Jesus says, I tell you that this man, rather than the others, went home justified before God. So the tax collector, rather than the others, went home justified before God. For all these who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those, all those who humble themselves will be exalted. And we've got this last line from Zacchaeus. The story of Zacchaeus where Jesus states his mission, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Zacchaeus wished to see Jesus, and over the crowd he could not, and the crowd rejected him, and Jesus went through the crowd to find Zacchaeus. And when Zacchaeus was seen, who he could be, not who he was, when he was seen by Jesus, not judged, then he decided to turn his life around. The words that we Christians say should be a reflection of Christ. Now, 
that Christ has died and risen, we take up his cross, right? We take up his mission and we continue on in that mission. And I would argue that sometimes the words that come out of our mouths are not Christ-like, right? When we take up the cross, we decide that we can be part of this seeking the lost and bringing them to Jesus for saving. If the lost see us as judgmental, and as I said, us as in a collective whole, the church, the big C church, not just us, but if the law see us as judgmental, hypocritical, and insensitive to others, that means we are projecting Jesus as judgmental, hypocritical, and insensitive to others. And I would argue that Jesus is in fact none of these things. Jesus saw past Zacchaeus' faults. Jesus looked past them, not if to say that cheating people was right, but Jesus saw Zacchaeus for who he was, and that was made in the image of God. And we know that because of this verse. Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is the son of Abraham. I would argue that our vision gets clouded much like the crowds of that day, and we tend to see who a person is, what they have done in their past, and not necessarily who they are in God's eyes, that they are created in the image of God. We miss that, that all are created in the image of God. So we've discussed what what the church or who, what the church is biblically, like what that idea is biblically, how the church is is designed and we've started to see the people and I want us to look at what the people think of the church the big C church (laughs) imagine with me if you will for just a minute imagine a church that sees that sees people for who God created them to be. Imagine a church that looks at a person and doesn't necessarily see the sin that's entangling them right at that moment, but sees who they could be, who God created them to be. Imagine a church that welcomes sinners and eats with them. A church that seeks out and sees the lost. A church that realizes that they are in fact in need of a savior, all of them. And a church that realizes that they were all at one point a lost sheep. A church that sees all humans as God's creation and made in the image of God. A church that sits down with the chief sinners and listens to their story and sees them. Listens to their heart and finds out what happened to get them to where they are in some, a church that comes alongside of them. A church that allows the Holy Spirit to speak and to guide instead of taking the wheel and telling people what they should or shouldn't do if they expect to have a seat in the church. Church that remembers how long it was before they were truly found and extends grace to others knowing that it was grace that was extended to them. Can you imagine that church and the kind of power that church would have? 
if there were people that felt comfortable coming in and being seen. And I would argue that much like the story of Zacchaeus, that if people were seen, not as the sin that they have had in their life, but if people are seen as made in the image of God, man, some of the turnarounds that, that would happen. If people would see the church as a place to go and be healed instead of a place to go and be hurt. I want us to sing this song um, as a closing, Christ Be Magnified, and I wanted us to sing it for two reasons. One is the second verse, well, the first verse and the second verse are both good, but the second verse, were the whole earth echoing his eminence, his name would burst from sea and sky. We can already say that all of creation, the, the trees, the flowers, the sky, all of that echoes God, right? God created it. We know that. Imagine if we came into that. If we, with our beings, were Christ-like to the point where uh, we were echoing his eminence with our actions. It says, from rivers to the mountaintops, we'd hear Christ be magnified. And I think that's true. I think that's true. I think as a church, like as a church, Big C Church, I'm not talking about just specifically our church, but I think as churches, we've gotten distracted from certain things. And we need to get back to being a church. And I think that that's what God is doing in this time, is I think he's redirecting and some of that means some hard changes, right? <laughs> and that's going to be hard. But I truly feel like that's what God's doing in this, in this time. I've felt for a long time that God was doing some big things. And I know he's doing big things here in Sheraton. I know he's doing big things all across the globe. And so I want us to focus in in this song and I want us to think about um, what actions in our life that maybe aren't Christ-like, that Christ isn't being magnified through those. And then, you know, as I said before, we've got to see who Christ is, and we see who we are, and we confess that difference, right? And that's the part we repent when we haven't, lived up when our actions aren't necessarily aligning with what Jesus would have done. We repent that difference. And part of repenting is that turning away from who we used to be, right? And so it's that turning away and fully just going forward with what it is that God's asked us to do. So let's sing this song, Christ Be Magnified. <laughs>